know, it's close to the end of the day. I hope you had a coffee. <laughs> so, um, but I hope my, my talk would be interesting because, you know, it is indeed one of the, um, you know, the title is JavaScript in WebAssembly. You know, why would you have JavaScript in WebAssembly? So it's really uh, why and how. So, so let's talk about the why first. So when, when WebAssembly first um, came out, it was designed to run side by side with JavaScript, right? That's how it gets started, you know. So in the browser, you would have a uh, you would have a JavaScript interpreter or Java or JIT JavaScript engine, like V8, and then you would have a WebAssembly runtime, and uh, they communicate through something called, um, you know, Watson binding. It's for Rust, and you know you could also have you know a C-based um, um, uh, bridges that bridge between WebAssembly and the JavaScript. So the idea really, you know, when WebAssembly was invented, I think it's almost 12 years ago. It's hard to believe it's, it has been that long. You know, is the idea is to run native application in the browser. Okay, you know, so we know that we run, we can run JavaScript in the browser, but uh, there's a whole bunch of applications for various reasons are written in C, C, C++, and uh, we want to compile them and uh, run them inside of the browser. And uh, obviously, we can't just run compile native code in browser. So WebAssembly was invented as a security sandbox or as a as a sandbox format for that purpose, right? You know, so. Well, the crown achievement actually happened, um, you know, uh, early this year when Photoshop says, um, you know, they have compiled the, the Photoshop application written in C into WebAssembly and you can run Photoshop in the browser, right? So that's the whole, how it started. You know, WebAssembly originally was designed as a supplement to JavaScript so that you can run a native application in the browser. But how it's going? You know, I think the the evolution of WebAssembly has has strong parallels of technology evolution in the past. Something started from the browser and then moved to the server side because it becomes because there's ten times more front end developers than back end developers. So people learned from um, you know people learned uh, front end developers learned it and it becomes standardized and uh, supported by the tool chains and then it becomes. Um, a backend technology, right? You know, so I think you know if you're old enough like me, you know, you would remember that's exactly how Java got started. You know, it used to be the applet and then servlet. It's also how Node.js started. It used to be JavaScript. On, uh, JavaScript used to be exclusively on the browser, and then it becomes a server-side technology. In fact, when people start to use Node.js to develop server applications, we were all like, "This, this, this is impossible, right? This is the wrong way to do it because you know JavaScript." Is a single-threaded uh, uh, execution environment. How can how can you possibly do a server-side application using a single-threaded um, execution environment? Right, WebAssembly is moving, um, you know, um, going through the same evolution or the same process. So you know that's um, that's how we see it's it's uh, um, the direction it's going. Is that you would have a um, um, you would have a VM or a, or a runtime. And it can run JavaScript applications and other applications inside this VM. So this is not necessarily as a supplement to JavaScript, but to run JavaScript inside WebAssembly. You know, of course, there's lots of engineering work that has to be done, and a lot of developer APIs that has to be developed, which I is, uh, would be the focus of my talk. So you know, all those plugins that plug into the uh, JavaScript interpreter or JavaScript runtime that's running inside the WebAssembly. So but it still hasn't answered, you know, so this is an article that we wrote, you know, that's um, how to run running JavaScript inside of WebAssembly. But with all this, you know, it's, we still haven't answered why, you know. That's, uh, um, you know, people look at that and say, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, this, I get this question all the time. You know, it's because when we use WebAssembly on the server side, we want to make it a container. You know, so that's, there was a famous saying, you know, back in 2019, is to say WebAssembly was invented in um, 2008, then, um, you know, Docker wouldn't be invented, you know, Docker's founder said that, right, you know. So what, um, all the world that we are envisioning is really to make WebAssembly much more like the JVM of the past and the Docker container of the more immediate past. It's to make it into a, 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 a runtime that can stand on its own instead of just a plugin mechanism for other platforms. You know, WebAssembly has been very successful to act as a plugin platforms for other 
plugin mechanism for other platforms. So for instance, in the browser, it's, uh, um, you don't use WebAssembly by its own. It's always interact with the JavaScript runtime with, uh, in some capacity because it doesn't have its own network support. It doesn't have access to the, uh, you know, the file system or other parts of the operating system. So, when you, so you use WebAssembly to do compute. And then when the result come back, you use JavaScript to render it, right? So in the browser. And another big WebAssembly use case is on the blockchain. It's the same. You know, so you have the consensus mechanism and all the platform being built. And you use WebAssembly to do one thing, to run smart contracts, right? You know, so the smart contract thing is really, you know, um, in my opinion, it's what serverless fun function should look like to begin with. You know, that's uh, because it's a piece of code that, um, that you write or anyone write. It can have very, you know, it can be, um, you know, have bugs in it or have bad intentions, and you submit it to a network. You don't care whose computer is running it, whose node is running it, you know, and, uh, but somehow you're going to get the correct result coming back from the, from the network, and you pay for each execution, right? You know, that's, you know, uh, in my mind, at least, you know, this is what serverless computing should look like. But in that context, WebAssembly still runs as a, um, um, as a plugin mechanism. So you have a much larger platform that is built, and then you use WebAssembly to, to um, you know, um, um, I would say an important but small piece of work that is doing the computation, right? It's stateless computation in particular. So, but our um, you know vision for for WebAssembly at least, you know, um, I started the project Wasm Edge, which is a, a WebAssembly runtime in CNCF. You know, so um, we have always wanted to make WebAssembly more like the JVM or more like a, a Docker container so that you can run an entire stack of software, including the networking, the, uh, to, to use WebAssembly to create, say, microservices, where you can call out to other services and you can respond to other services as well. To make WebAssembly to do AI inference, replacing the, the Python layer of you know, um, um, AI programming using Rust and compile that into WebAssembly, right? In order to do that, we need a WebAssembly runtime that is more in encompassing. And the benefit of that is also very, very strong because by using, um, by using WebAssembly as a container format, you know, um, one of the things I learned from this, um, from this conference is that there's a huge focus on um, um, you know, cloud security and software su uh, supply chain security issues. I'll leave it. Um, that's, um, you know, in this conference, right? And WebAssembly is really one of the, I think, you know, um, um, at least from my, my point of view, is one of the leading candidates that can, can, can help with those security issues. Because if you, look, uh, if you have Linux container, you essentially have a very wide attack surface. You know, you have, um, because you are running Linux, you could have SSH turned on and not knowing it, right? You know, so you, there's lots of issues that you have to deal with. But for things like WebAssembly, you can really lock it down. It has a very tiny, um, you know, uh, attack service it's, it, it exposed. It has a very simple software supply chain, you know, because you compile everything into a single bytecode and, and you run it. So there's many, many benefits of running WebAssembly as its own um, container format or as, or as its own, um, 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 you know, runtime for microservices, right? And uh, we can make WebAssembly to be fully OCI compliant, which is the graph that I draw on the other side, which is um, the, the green boxes are the things that we already implemented and support, is to say, you know, um, I, can, I can build a Docker image that has only one WebAssembly file in it, and then publish it on Docker Hub. So if I use Kubernetes to run that Docker image, it would, uh, say, wrong format. It would complain, because it doesn't see Linux in it, right? However, by changing at the OCI level, at the OCI runtime level, by changing CRON and run C, so we are now already merging into the upstream of CRON, I can, um, I can make the runtime aware whether this is a WebAssembly runtime or a Docker or a Linux runtime. And if it sees a, a single WebAssembly file that in the Docker image, it would know to invoke Wasm Edge to run this WebAssembly file and uh, run all the services and applications in it, right? You know, so, by, by making that change, um, because Kubernetes is such a real um, nicely layered system, so you know it can work with ContainerD, it can work with all the um, you know um, the CRI runtimes and the Kubernetes run um, Kubernetes applications and everything about it, right? So our idea has really been um, we want to use WebAssembly as a security sandbox and container to run microservices side by side with other 
OCI um, with Linux containers and VMs and you know things of that nature. So you know, so um, that's that's um, and in order to do that, we have to support you no know, JavaScript because a lot of microservice developers, um, we can't tell people you have to use Rust to do that. Although I love to tell people that, but you know, uh, in reality, you know, maybe ninety percent the developers are using JavaScript or or you know. Or languages of that nature. So in order to make it widely applicable and make it widely adopted as a, as a, um, as a microservice runtime, we would have to figure out a way to run JavaScript inside WebAssembly. You know, because now we, uh, in order to run this, whole, uh, because the whole value proposition is this is a container. It contains everything that runs in it. I can't have a lot of things that hanging around it, you know, those, uh, um, you know, a V8 or something like that, that hands around the WebAssembly runtime and give people a big binary and to say, you know, just run this. I have to uh, put everything together as a, as a, as a container and then it runs WebAssembly bytecode, right? So in order to do that, I think that is the primary driver of trying to run JavaScript inside WebAssembly is to say, I want to write microservices. And uh, the microservices is completely contained within the WebAssembly runtime. It's managed by Kubernetes, like um, a Docker container and a VM that's, um, that, that exists in the same cluster, right? So this is why, you know, that's, uh, um, that's why, you know, we, we spend so much time trying to, um, you know, run JavaScript inside WebAssembly. So there's, Lots of use cases, you know. There's, um, um, yeah. So, you, you, know, you know, I'll go over them just um, very briefly. So, so there's many cases where, um, you know, uh, you want a microservice that is uh, that is um, that is managed by WebAssembly instead of um, a Linux container. Although there's lots of, you know, today there's lots of microservices that are managed by Linux by Linux containers, right? You know, those are uh, long-running um, services that needs the full capability of Linux. However, you can have a lot of services that's uh, transactional in nature, or it's uh, or it has to live on the on the edge cloud on the CDN network, or it has to be um, or it has to be run on the, on the edge device. So for instance, you know, um, the example I always give is uh, say if you have a dog camera, the dog camera has uh, taking a stream of pictures, and uh, one of the things that you don't want it to do is to send every picture into the cloud to recognize it because there's lots of privacy issues. And most of the time, it's people you know, it's your family members and you know, things like that. Only in a rare case, it would find a stranger. And it's in that case, it should recognize that and send you an alert, right? You know, so it's, there's a lot of benefit to do it on that device, although the device may not have that capability. So do it in your home, in, your, in, a, in, a, uh, in a server you install in a home, like in a set-top box or in a NAS. And the, barring that, to go to an um, a edge data center, that's something within your city to do it. Instead of going all the way to the internet and process, get processed, you, know, you don't know where it is, right? So you know, that's, um, for cases like that, I think those are the sweet spot for, say, uh, WebAssembly-based microservices, right? You know, that's because those services can be uh, programmed and uh, executed in a very efficient manner. And uh, ideally, people want to use JavaScript to do that. You know, they don't want to, uh, at least we are at the stage where you know um, um, there are not that many Rust or C plus plus developers who can um, you know um, uh, who's available to do that, right? You know, so so that's uh, so that's the use case. Well, so um, for the rest of the talk, I will talk a little bit about you know how we did it, right? So the the basis of the implementation is also simple and it's built on other people's work. You know, so um, there's a wonderful project in the, in the community called QuickJS. It's a it's a um, it's a very compact JavaScript interpreter, right? You know, uh, it's written in C, um, C or C plus plus. I forgot, but it so happens it can be compiled into WebAssembly. So now we can have a JavaScript interpreter that uh, understand all the JavaScript syntax in the language and and uh, and run it inside WebAssembly. And with that, I can feed that interpreter another JavaScript file, so that that JavaScript file can also be executed inside of WebAssembly, right? You know, so that's really the basic idea. So you know, there's, um, um, yeah. So, so you can see it does basic stuff, right? You know, that's, uh, um, you, you know, it, um, it does all, uh, understand JavaScript syntax and and it can run the JavaScript program. However, when I tell people. Web, um, you know, we now support JavaScript. People immediately 
take an existing JavaScript application and try to run it, and invariably, most, you know, 99% of the time it fail. Because JavaScript has a, such a big ecosystem, you can't just say, I can do pure JavaScript or standalone JavaScript program. Most JavaScript applications out there has some, depend on some kind of other modules. So you all have to support other modules in your, in your runtime as well. So this is the work that we did, you know, that's to support ES6 modules in, um, in our JavaScript runtime. So this example, if you're interested, you can, you can look into the code. But it's not, you know, it's just a very vanilla demo, you know, that shows how to define a module and, and, and how to call the module. Well, of course, the Java, JavaScript ecosystem has more than ES6. So we went ahead and uh, supported the common JS as well through the rollup.js, um, roll right? You know, that's, uh, it allows you to, um, what's the word they use for it? It's, um, it, it's not cross-compile, but uh, rollup. You know, so it figures out all the dependency of the, your JavaScript application and download all those modules and com combine them into a, very, uh, into a big file. And then you just execute that big file of JavaScript. So that solves the CommonJS modules um, uh, support problem, right? You know, so that's, um, so CommonJS, NPM, and uh, ES6 can both be supported in, um, with this, um, you know, um, with the runtime that we have built for web, uh, for web assembly, for, for wasm in particular. But we should not stop here because, you know, one of the great advantage of um, web assembly is its performance. And if we introduce a Java interpreter and just stop there, then the performance would really suffer because you know, the, 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 you know, the benchmark or the leading JavaScript engine is V8. Uh, V8 has, I think, 15 years of our optimization and thousands of PhDs has worked on that, right? You know, so it's, uh, it's impossible to exceed um, you know, um, um, the level of GIT optimization and the performance that's, that's being achieved there, right? So, you know, uh, to have a simple JavaScript interpreter, you would uh, um, have the problem that people would say, you know, it's nice to run it inside the WebAssembly and, uh, you know, have those security and uh, footprint and, uh, um, you know, and, and, and start time benefits. You know, those are all orders of magnitude better than, say, uh, running Node.js inside a, inside, a, um, an inside a Linux container, right? However, you don't have V8. You know, um, so, so at runtime, you are like, you know, uh, three times slower. You know, so, that's, um, um, so that would be unacceptable. Um, so one of the things that we, um, that we really wanted to do is to take advantage of the, um, you know, um, multilingual or, you know, the, 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 the ability for WebAssembly to support multiple compiled languages. So um, solution that we come up with is really to build a Rust API that allows Rust developers to write um, JavaScript APIs. So um, the idea here really is that, you know, so if I want to perform something like uh, AI inference or something that consumes, a, uh, takes a long time to complete, to complete, I write this function in Rust. However, there's an API that allows it to, uh, that allow me to expose it as if it is a JavaScript function. Okay, so other, when other developers come in, they can just call that JavaScript function and it would, uh, um, you, you know, the, the, the system knows how to route it to the, to the, to the Rust application that compiled to WebAssembly, and then execute it in a much more efficient way. So I think um, by using that, we can increase the, the, um, the runtime performance of a lot of functions by, 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 you know, by a large margin, right? You know, because essentially this is how Python does machine learning. You know, that's all people so always say, you know, Python does machine learning, but it's not. You know, that's Python. Most of the heavyweight machine learning stuff is passed to the underlying C++ library. So if you just have a pure Python uh, interpreter or environment, you, you actually cannot run TensorFlow or anything like that. You know, that's, uh, um, you have to have C APIs plug in there. It's the same kind of ideas, right? You know, so you have compiled language and high performance um, language that allows system developers to develop those APIs. and. Uh, um, and then present them as if they're JavaScript APIs so that JavaScript developers can use them. You know, so that's, um, and based on this idea, there are, um, there are a couple of things that we did. So for instance, on Wasm Edge, um, uh, using um, JavaScript, now you can, um, you can create, um, you know, you can invoke other web services or you can create a server that respond to, to, um, to inbound requests using non-blocking network I.O. You know, meaning that's um, you know, although it's a single-threaded environment like like other JavaScript environment, but it's non-blocking, so it's uh, there's a scheduler that can schedule things around. So you know, um, so you can have multiple connections at the same time while it's wait for 
each of them to finish. It can it can it can accept more connections instead of blocking, right? So you know, so here are some code examples. That's uh, that's um, um, you know making a HTTP request and um, getting a re HTTP response. And the um, the way that we implemented that is through uh, Rust. So you know, so we have a um, you know we have a, so we write a Rust program that uses the um, um, you know, we also have a socket API for, for WebAssembly by, um, by supplementing the, the WebAssembly SWASI standard, you know, WebAssembly system interface by letting, uh, giving it the ability to handle socket, right? You know, and uh, use the Rust to access that layer and then expose those, this, um, this Rust API as JavaScript API that allows people to write application uh, programs like this, right? You know, so, uh, so programs like this should be very familiar to, um, to, um, uh, to JavaScript developers, right? Because, you know, um, there's no Rust here. There's uh, not even WebAssembly here, right? You know, for uh, as far as they're concerned, you know, I'm writing a JavaScript application that does some kind of server or um, you know uh, HTTP client operation, and uh, I can package it as a web service and uh, and enjoy the benefits of all the um, you know WebAssembly container formats that give me, uh, like security, like footprint, the startup time, and all that stuff, right? So here's one example, and. Uh, the other example that's related is, uh, you know, um, in Node.js, there's a new API that's, uh, you know, people have been asking for, like, forever. It's a fetch API, right? You know, um, with fetch, you can do a lot of interesting stuff. For instance, you can do server-side rendering. You know, you can, you can have a React application that's rendered on the server because it doesn't, um, um, uh, because it can fetch all the data from, from um, you know, while, while the page is being rendered, right? But in order to do that, um, in order to do that on the server, you need the the um, the server side stack to be able to um, uh, access um, other net um, you know um, other network protocols, access the database and access other web services, right? You know, so so um, um, so we implement that as well. And uh, then there's another use case where I thought it was interesting is that we have uh, uh, we have written you know we have built a WebAssembly extension that interact with TensorFlow. So it's pretty much like what Python does, right? So you have Python, and the interpreter, and then the TensorFlow library underneath it. So we replace Python with WebAssembly, okay? And uh, um, for, for inference only, right? You know, so we have a, um, so that allows people to write a Rust application that interact with the underlying, um, um, you know, um, a TensorFlow library, so that it can do, uh, it can run uh, TensorFlow models to do things like image recognition and things like that. And on top of that, we package that Rust library into web, uh, JavaScript APIs. So here is just an example. I think it's fairly straightforward to understand. You know, it's just a read image, import image, read image, and then um, you know define the input cursor, uh, uh, you know, a tensor to say you know how the you know that's um, what is the input format of the model. You know, how do I structure this image? And then run through the model, and then it gives the result. So you know that's um, so we have a demo on our website. You know, so it's uh, give it a picture of a hot dog. It will tell you it's a hot dog, right? You know, that's a, so it's a, um, um, a very typical um, a mobile net demo. So you know, um, so that also ties together. You know, that gives a very simple JavaScript API to do uh, AI inference. It's hence it's uh, it's uh, you know. The example I, that I have just mentioned, you know, the, the facial recognition, you can see it can be done this way, right? So a JavaScript developer wouldn't be able to write an application that does facial recognition from a camera, and uh, um, uh, underneath it, it would take advantage of all the, um, you know, um, TensorFlow. If there is GPU, it can use GPU, and uh, all the data preparation is done by Rust. But the API stays uh, JavaScript, so that the developer would be able to. Um, you know, the application developer would be able to use a very simple API to build their service, to build their microservice for, say, edge devices, you know, or things like that. Yeah. So, you know, here's a more complex example. You know, that's, uh, um, we can do actually the full React 18 streaming SSR. You know, the React 18 uh, allows way, uh, a way for, for the entire UI to be rendered on the server side by executing the JavaScript that meant for the browser on the server side, you know, it's called isomorphic application, uh, uh, web programming, right? You know, meaning the same, same piece of code that can run on the client side and on the server side. So, you know, um, we, uh, we have completed this demo to show that this, this, this thing works um, fully from end to end, you know, that's, uh, so, um, you know, our JavaScript engine can, can, can handle a complex use case like that. So, 
um, yeah, this is a demo. You know, that's um, if you're interested, you can you, you can look into that. But there are more. You know, that's uh, you know. So um, we have done all this. However, you know, we have also um, encountered a lot of issues. You know, that's uh, um, what are the issues that we have encountered. You know, that's uh, is when we start to tell people that we support JavaScript, people immediately get an existing JavaScript library, like I said, and try to run it. However, if you look at the JavaScript libraries that's out there, maybe, um, especially on the server side, maybe 90% of them use some kind of Node.js API. You know, they use Node.js to do networking and you know, things like that. That would, uh, be, you know, that would cause issues on our end because we only know JavaScript. We don't know Node.js APIs. So there's a, a big community effort that's going on with, uh, within the Wasm Edge community. And uh, I'd love to have you guys contribute to that. Or, you know, um, it's uh, um, our GitHub repository is issue 1535. And we have a long list of um, uh, uh, JavaScript APIs that we need to support in our, um, um, uh, in our runtime. And some of them, uh, you know, they each have different priorities. You know, that's, um, we have one, it's, um, priority two is the most, uh, is the, are the most important ones that we need to support immediately. And we have also, some of them we can use other JavaScript to polyfill. Right? We can use JavaScript to implement JavaScript. But, uh, but quite a few of them that we have to drop down to the operating system level, meaning that we have to use Rust or C to, uh, to implement them and uh, to, um, uh, to supplement the runtime in order to, um, in order to, in order to support them. So um, um, why I call it a community effort? Because we are working with uh, the Linux Foundation's internship program. So we have um, uh, four summer interns, they are graduate students, and they are, um, they are working on different aspects of this. And, uh, um, you know, so hopefully by the end of the summer, you know, by, you know, we, by the next conference, we would be able to say that we have full support of the Node.js API. So now we should have, a, um, by then, we should have a much more complete, um, you know, JavaScript story because most of the JavaScript libraries would be able to run on, um, you know, uh, on the bottom edge platform. So, you know, that's, um, but that's also something we would love to see, um, you know, more community engagement and, uh, um, you know, um, um, come to our GitHub and tell us what you want to see and uh, whether this approach is right or wrong, you know, or, you know, what are, the, your, what are your favorite JavaScript libraries that you want to see that runs inside the WebAssembly, and uh, um, we can figure out what API it uses, right, and then prioritize the, the, um, the kind of APIs or, or, or um, whether it's, um, you, you know, in you know, Node.js or, or something else um, that we can support, right, you know, so, so that's, um, um, yeah, that's, um, we love to see, um, you know, uh, participation from you guys. Yeah. So, um, well, that would have went through all the, um, you know, um, um, uh, implementation, um, I think, ideas and, uh, um, you know, um, and the need, right? <laughs> you know, that's, uh, so I have one last topic is uh, QuickJS versus V8. You know, so um, because, the, um, I think this comparison is invariable. Um, and I have talked about a lot of those issues that's um, um, throughout my talk just now. Is that people say, you know, in JavaScript, there's a crown jewel, it's called V8. You know, you cannot exceed performance of V8. That's, I acknowledge. You know, that's, uh, you know it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much impossible to exceed. It's just, uh, you know, I, I've looked at the source code. It's, uh, it's beyond comprehension, most, uh, you know, at least beyond me, right? You know, but, uh, um, you know, so the first objection really is that QuickJS is much slower than V8, especially with GIT um, turn up, right? You know, however, um, like I said, we believe the key bottlenecks can be improved dramatically, including stream processing, including AI inference, including things that are really takes a lot of time, you know, because if things only take like five milliseconds, then being three times slower is not a big deal. It's 15 milliseconds. However, if something takes close to 100 milliseconds, then being you know, 10 times slower would take about one, four seconds. So that would be bad, right? You know, so we try to identify those uh, performance bottlenecks and implement them in Rust and try to, um, try to improve JavaScript performance in our runtime this way. And uh, um, the second thing I think that speaks to the benefit of QuickJS approach is that it's much smaller than V8, especially if you consider V8 is not a container, so V8 has to be run inside Docker or inside Linux container, that would give you like one gigabytes of, you know, 
a footprint. You know, that's because you have to have the Linux libraries and you know things of that nature put in there. Um, and uh, uh, Wasm Edge with QuickJS is like 10 megabytes or less. You know, that's uh, so. So that is a very big difference in terms of uh, footprint. And uh, um, we'd like to believe, or we'd like to we like to say that was, um, QuickJS in Wasm Edge in, in a WebAssembly container is safer because it's a it's a, it's a smaller attack surface. It's a, um, um, it's a simpler supply chain. And, uh, it's, um, and uh, um, the Wasm runtime is designed to be a security sandbox, um, at least in the browser, right? So, um, in, in fact, you know, um, a V8, turn, uh, which GIT turned out, has become problematic on the server side. You know, that's, um, I think a lot of people know that because, you know, one of the fundamental problems is that um, a V8 is fundamentally designed for the browser. So, uh, if, the, if some issues that only happens on the server, you would have, um, it's, um, you know, the V8 team say that, you know, it's not a priority for us to fix that, you know, as of which I can completely understand. You know, that's because, you know, um, um, you know um, um, uh, the most important thing for them is to make it run better in the Chrome browser, right? You know, so, so um, on the server side, especially in a, in a, in a large computing density environment where you, uh, uh, where you have to run a lot of other people's code, we believe WebAssembly is, uh, um, we we'll, are we'll argue for that. We'll, we'll argue that WebAssembly is a better um, is a better security model. Yeah. So um, of course, then the last thing, QuickJS in in Wasm Edge is more manageable. It's because we can do OCI compliance. We can have full integration with Kubernetes and uh, other um, you know container tools like ContainerD, CRIO, and all those we have experiment. You no, know, we have tested and uh, and validated that they can load. Um, you know. Um, 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 WebAssembly files or WebAssembly based images and have them run in the same cluster with, um, you know, so our ideal world is you have one cluster that runs the VM, the container, and the WebAssembly runtime. So all three things can be run side by side depending on what type of task you want. You know, so WebAssembly would run, say, computational intensive but transactional in nature tasks, right? You know, and the Linux container would be run long running tasks and the VM would run high security tasks, you know. You know, so you can have, um, you know, that would give, um, you know, uh, I think the office people a lot more flexibility to, um, to do those things, yeah. Well, so there, um, of course, you know, that's, um, um, you know, um, the approach we just talked about is our approach. There are other ways to do that, you know, so there's, uh, um, 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 a Mozilla has, a, has their own JavaScript runtime that is called SpiderMonkey, and there's a major effort to compile SpiderMonkey into WebAssembly. And uh, also have a have a, um, um, a Rust interface to that, so that allows it to do everything that uh, that uh, I have just shown, but in a different WebAssembly, um, in a different JavaScript runtime. You know, so instead of QuickJS, we can do SpiderMonkey. We really look forward to that because SpiderMonkey has GIT in it, so it could really improve performance. You know, although it could be bigger than QuickJS, but it would be super nice to offer the community's choice. You know, whether you want a larger footprint, but uh, or you want a, um, or you want a faster performance, right? You know, so that's that's one thing. And then um, uh, Shopify has a, has a project called Jabby, and it's a Rust wrapper around QuickJS, which is also similar to our approach. But it's um, you know that's uh, um, 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 well, we'd say uh, Jabby is more of a, a, a runtime independent approach. You know, so it's uh, it's try to conform to the WebAssembly standard only, and we do a lot of our own. Um, extensions to WebAssembly runtime because we are, uh, you know, because our project is a WebAssembly runtime. So we can <laughs> we try to optimize it for the use cases that we identify, like running JavaScript, right? So you know, so um, I think that would be the difference. You, so I think Jabby would have less capability than the things I have just demonstrated, but it's going to run across different WebAssembly runtimes, so it has better portability. So yeah, and uh, then. Um, the other approach that we have been experimenting with, and uh, I, I would really love to hear uh, the community feedback and to see if anyone wants to do it, is to use V8 as host functions, meaning that uh, um, can occasion, but at the bottom you have WASI that goes to libc, you have um, you know um, um, uh, um, uh, you know the AI inference stuff like like TensorFlow that goes to the TensorFlow library, and then you have JavaScript in, in, um, execution goes to V8. So this is also something that we are experimenting with, um, you know, but um, you know. Um, we're an open source project. We'd love to, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to researchers and uh, students and developers and try to convince them to do this, right? You know, that's what, also why I'm here. You know, that's, uh, um, you, you know, um, 
you try to engage the community to to see if uh, if there are people um, you, you know that's uh, like-minded developers who wants to, uh, to uh, who wants to explore those ideas further. Yeah. So yeah, that's the end of my talk. Yeah, that's uh, um, thank you very much for your for your patience at uh, uh, you know um, um, you know late afternoon today. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, I, I, I believe we have a couple minutes. That's, uh, you know. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so uh, let me repeat the question. So the question is how exactly it works, how, the, how, different, thing, how different components work, uh, fit together, right? You know, that's, uh, um, so it's, the way it works really is that, you know, so you have QuickJS that's written in C, and uh, QuickJS compiles into WebAssembly. And uh, QuickJS, and then we have a Rust API that is, um, um, that is compiled with QuickJS, okay, but access the plumbing that we build into Wasm Edge, you know, meaning to access the, the networking, the file system, the, the, the TensorFlow, and all that stuff, right? So what you would get is uh, the, the Wasm Edge container and the WebAssembly module that runs inside it. This module is the JavaScript runtime. And then I feed it with a JavaScript file Right, so the JavaScript file is a text file that's passed in as a parameter to this module, and uh, so so from the top, all you see is is Wasm Edge. So when you start Wasm Edge, let me show you the uh, command line. I think, yeah. So um, this is how to use Wasm Edge on the command line, right? You know, that's there's there, there's many different ways to use Wasm Edge. So um, at Wasm Edge, so it's the the Wasm file is Wasm Edge QuickJS, which is QuickJS compiled to Wasm Edge, okay? And with the, um, with the Rust API already bundled in it. And then you pass another parameter, it's called hello.js, which is a, uh, you can pass that as a string or you can pass that as a file. And uh, so the uh, Wasm Edge loads the Wasm module first, and then from the Wasm module, it loads the JS file, and then it loads the rest of the parameters. It executes that JS file inside this module. So there's uh, only one Wasm runtime that's involved in here. Yes? So, so what, what, so I'm sorry, what command produced the Wasm file? Oh, um, yeah, so that's in our documentation. You know, that's, um, um, it's, um, it's a Rust compile, com it's, um, um, so this QuickJS, we have a Rust wrapper around it, so it's presented itself as a Rust project. So, so you build it with Crit, and uh, but say the target is um, um, is Wasm instead of a CPU target in, in, instead of ARM or or, or x86, you know. So it would, uh, um, and so the build artifact, the the, the result is a um, is a binary file that's dot Wasm. You know, so basically, yeah. So um, there's something that's uh, there are things that are already built in, like the networking stuff, and you know everything I show is they already built in here. However, if you want to add your own, you know, that's using Rust to implement your own JavaScript API, you would have to fork that um, that's on Wasm Edge QuickJS project. And uh, there's a there's a um, there's an extension folder that put your Rust uh, code in there and compile it into WebAssembly again. So that's also one of the thing, interesting things about WebAssembly is that it always produces, or at least at now, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talks about in the, um, you know dependency modules and you know things like that. But at least for now, it produces a single executable binary. And so it's really easy to determine it's uh, it's a supply chain, you know, it's uh, what goes in there. You can um, you can fairly easily analyze it, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, please. So one last question, please, yeah. So what's the difference between Wasm Edge and Wasm Prime? 
Um, so the question is, what's the difference? Well, that's, um, you know, I was hoping an easier question, but that's, uh, you know, <laughs> but the, um, you know, the, I would say there's two big differences. You know, one is the implementation is different. You know, Wasm Time itself is implemented in Rust. Wasm Edge is implemented in C, C++, and uh, it has uh, uh, many interfaces, and Rust is one of the interfaces it provides, right? Um, um, we believe, uh, although there's, um, we, we are in the Rust community, so a lot of people keep asking, you know, why don't you do that? I, I, it strongly reminded me of the old days of Java communities. So they always ask, why don't you re rewrite this in Java? You know, that's, uh, why don't you write J JVM in Java? You know, that's, uh, you know but uh, um, from our point of view, because we want Wasm Edge to be more adapt to edge computing, so we want it to be in places where, um, you know, um, where the Rust tool chain may not be so well established. So for instance, on RISC-V CPU, um, inside the uh, Intel TEE, you know, the, the um, uh, Intel SGX, and you know, that sort of hardware environment, and also in non-Linux operating systems, like, uh, you know, like we adapted to cell 4 which is a real-time operating system. You know, that's, uh, um, so there's a lot of those places, and the Open Harmony, you know, there's, uh, there are a lot of those places where um, the Rust tool chain may not be um, that well established, but we still want to compile the runtime, right? You know, so that's one of the reasons. And another reason, of course, I think there, the, the, the community needs diversity in, in terms of uh, WebAssembly runtime. You can't have just the one WebAssembly runtime and if, there, if there's a bug discovered in there and then everybody breaks, right? You know, that's, uh, so, you know, from that aspect, so that's one thing. The second is the features. You know, I think Wasm Time, I think it's, um, um, it's a bytecode alliance project. We are a CNCF project, right? You know, so, so um, we take, um, you know, uh, our philosophy has been um, build first and uh, see what becomes the standard. You know, we don't um, try to come up with a standard first, you know, so for instance, our contribution to WASI has been, uh, we have been trying to, you, you have seen all the experiments that we, that we have done, and none of them are current standard. We want to see what the community can adopt and then try to push them as standard, right? You know, so um, one of the issue with the standard first approach, however, you know, that's, we have seen that very clearly from, from the early days of Java, you know, when there's EJB versus Spring and, you know, all that things, you know, uh, and today, you know, one of the big frustrations in the WebAssembly runtime community is that, um, say, networking capability in WebAssembly was in socket has been lagging for almost two years and there's uh, very little progress made in the standard community because, you know, um, I, I think people who make standard doesn't really um, have this need because, um, you know, most, um, because a lot of people are running WebAssembly as an embedded runtime. So, uh, so it's not an urgent need to make a WebAssembly a uh, standalone runtime that runs microservices. So things like that has been laggy. And, uh, um, but for us, you know, that we take a different approach. We, uh, implement first. It may be right, may be wrong. Who knows? But uh, the community gonna tell us. You know, uh, if the, out of nine, ten things that we did, nine things may well be wrong. But one thing would be good. You know, would be right. And then we push that to be a standard. So you know, that's um, that essentially our approach. You know, so I, of course, there's many many technical details that we are different from Wasm time and Wasm round times. But I think those are the biggest philosoph uh, high level differences. All right, yeah, thank you. <laughs>